Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes to each and every one of you. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us today from wherever you're participating. We're so excited that today is finally here. We want to acknowledge each and every one of you with so much gratitude for holding this collective virtual space in ways that despite the challenges of this moment, we may not have had the opportunity to convene like this before. Like many of you out there here at Movement Generation, we've been in deep reflection and coalescing in this time, asking ourselves and our community, what does this moment mean for us? What brought us to the circumstances that we're in? What systems and policies driven by greed and extraction are failing us right now? And how do we move to respond collectively, codifying the shifts possible in this moment when the landscape is wide open? We wanna acknowledge that we're here today largely due to the power, love and resilience of our ancestors by blood, of our movement ancestors. And in this moment, now more than ever, we need their guidance. The foundation that they built from their joy, their struggle, their vision, and their willingness to give their lives for a liberation that they knew they would likely never see in their lifetime is what we continue to build upon today. Give thanks. We recognize we're holding this moment together, that not one of us has all of the solution but that all of us have an abundance of lived experience, knowledge, skills, and tools that we can come together and become a stronger force to reckon with. Resilience, after all, reminds us that our diversity is our best defense. So in this powerful time of possibility to act collectively, to make the ecological and economic shifts we need, our intention today is to plant seeds together to lead with our hearts in building real solutions and strategies that address the structural inequities that got us into this mess in the first place. We hope that these sessions will bring forth questions, curiosity, feedback, critical dialogue, and action in your study groups and your communities at large. So if you're able to right now, grab a pen and some paper, write down your thoughts, your questions, express your artistic inspirations, whatever comes up. Once again, we want to thank you for joining us as we learn from and with each other today. I'm going to move into some basic access and tech information today. MGC's disability and language justice is a central and necessary piece of liberation for people and the planet. Our comrades in the disability justice movement teach us that access is not just about logistics, but a collective responsibility to put into practice how we want to live in this world together. We are practicing this today and it will not be perfect. We'll be sending out a survey after the session and we welcome your feedback, suggestions and access on access in the course in general. First, Spanish interpretation. Uh, we wanna thank Marianela Aguirre and Andreina Maldonado who will be interpreting today. Um, and we're going to actually ask them at this moment if they can come in and make an announcement as to how to join the line. Buenas tardes. Um, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Marianela and I'm going to be interpreting with Andreina Maldonado. Um, we are very um, excited to be able to participate with Movement Generations course correction workshops and to be able to provide language access for today's session. We wanted to remind all of a few guidelines to keep in mind as um, simultaneous Spanish interpretation will be going on on a Spanish line throughout the entire workshop. We've asked the facilitators and speakers to always say their name before speaking, to speak slower than usual, to speak directly into the mic, to not use acronyms and to say complete words instead, and also to wait a few seconds after someone speaks to say something. Um, 
you also may hear us um, every once in a while interrupt the speakers to remind them to slow down because um, visibility through the cameras isn't as easy to do. And um, so we just wanted to remind everybody to keep those things in mind. Um, we wanna thank you for your patience and your understanding. If you have friends that would like to access the Spanish line through the dial-in number, the number is 844-855-4444. And the access code is 169-6957. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, and we also just wanna to add to, there's gonna be uh, international lines and we'll chat the call-in number again. Uh, and uh, the link to find your international line. Um, also, we have ASL interpretation for today. Thank you, Nora Joy Rodriguez and Deb Taylor of Terps for Bay Area Resistance who will be our ASL interpreters today. We'll be making sure that the ASL interpreter stays on the screen at all times. During screen share, like it is now, they'll be showing in a very small window. If you're watching through th this through Zoom, not Facebook Live, you can enlarge that window by dragging its corner and you can also move that window around if necessary. Live captioning, we'll also be providing live captions. Thank you to our captioner, C. Jeanette Christian from 2020 Captioning. If you're watching in Zoom, there's a closed caption icon in your Zoom controls. You can change the size of the text using the instructions here. You click the arrow next to the CC icon and choose subtitle settings. If you're watching in Facebook Live, you can also turn the captions on and off in the controls of the window video or the video window. Last but not least, I just want to shout out that we have a graphic note taker today, uh, Yuki Kirokoro, uh, who is a talented artist and who is also a staff member of Climate Justice Alliance, our comrades and homies. Uh, we're going to try to show her work at some points during the session, and we'll definitely share the final project after the session. We will be providing a recording of today's session and all following sessions, as well as a transcript and Spanish interpretation of the recording. Uh, later on in our session, we'll be having a Q&A section. Uh, we ask that question and comments go into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window, not into the chat so that we can uh, keep track of the questions that are coming up. We also wanna thank New Economy Coalition for the use of their webinar account uh, we had to quickly upgrade because of the popularity of this course, uh, which we're very, we're happy for. Um, and we want to deeply appreciate their contribution to this movement technology. We'll announce later how you can donate to them and help us and them fund this technology. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm so excited to welcome our next guest and comrade, Leah Penniman, uh, who's a farmer food sovereignty activist, the author of the book, Farming While Black, and co-founder of Soul Fire Farms in Grafton, New York. And I know this is just a few of the many things that you do, Leah. Uh, and for folks who are interested in learning more, Leah's bio, her full bio will be linked in the chat. Please join me in welcoming Leah Pennon. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Leah. My pronouns are she, Lee, he, and ya. And it is a deep honor to be with all of you today and to be invited to offer the opening blessing and reflection to ground us in this space. My teachers have emphasized that this time of pandemic calls us to ecological humility. It is time for us to drop the arrogant imagining that we have dominion over all creatures on this planet and the waters and the air. And it is time for us to instead remember that we are kin with all the non-human beings here on this sacred earth. That the only way through this difficult time is by remembering our rightful place of humility among the way of things. And so today I want to offer a very intimate and special prayer uh, that has been part of my maternal lineage, lineage for generations. Uh, my mother's family is from Haiti, from a Caribbean island that was the first to overthrow slavery and outlaw slavery in its constitution. 
And this prayer pays homage and respect to the forces of nature that are our siblings. Um, so I pray that you will uh, bear with me while I share this prayer and hopefully regardless of your spiritual or religious tradition or not, um, that you will be able to gain something uh, by witnessing and participating in this piece of my family's story. So we begin first by breathing. I invite you to take three deep breaths with me such that you fill not just your chest, but your belly and your back and all the way down to your toes and exhale. And again, breathe in, fill chest, belly, back, toes, and release. And one more time together, fill all the way up to the corners of your body, the edges of self, and release. If able, you can reach down and touch the earth, touch the ground with your fingers or your forehead or give a kiss to the earth. This is how we salute the mother of us all. And so we open our prayer by calling on Legba, also named Eshu, also named Elegua. Legba is the guardian of the crossroads and the one who helps us see beyond the material physical plane that we find ourselves in in most moments and into the spiritual plane, the realm of our ancestors, of magic, of mystery, of wonder, and of deep connection. We ask Legba to open the gate, to open our hearts, to clear the obstacles so that we may be fully present to all that this moment and this community offers to us. If able, you can turn now and face the east. Ago Maulisa, creator of the universe. Ago Nana Baruku, womb of the solar system. Ago Dambala Aida Wedo, the serpent and the rainbow that envelop our planet. We pay homage to you, creator spirits, for making all the seen and unseen wonders in this vast and precious universe. And we thank you for allowing us to be part of it in this short and precious life. Ashe. Now we turn and we face the West. Ago Eseli Danto, Eseli Frida, guardians of love and motherhood and the salt waters of womb. Ago Agasu, La Siren, Agwe, the ocean and the creatures of the ocean who nourish us and who accompanied, accompanied many of us on our journey to the diaspora, reminding us we were not alone. Ago Simbi, you are the one who brings waters from the aquifers up through the wells and pipes so that we can quench our thirst, so that we can water our crops, so that we have tears to cry for times of joy and sorrow. We thank you for waterfalls, for rivers, for raindrops, and for the blood which courses through our veins, Ashi. We turn now and face the north. Ago Grambois, guardian of the forest. Ago Azaka, guardian of the farm. Ago Aisan Loko, guardians of our deep history of connection to land. Ago Ochosi, who marks the path. Ago 
Osain, who brings forth herbs that heal us. We give thanks for the food in our bellies. We give thanks for the soil that brings forth abundance. We give thanks for the firm earth that catches every footstep and supports us relentlessly. We give thanks for the habitats for the birds and mammals and amphibians and reptiles that we share a home with. We give thanks for the delicate and beautiful web of ecology of which we are a part. Ashe. We turn now and face the south. Ago ogun fere ogu baragri ogu osain shango. You are the spirits of fire, of lightning, of passion, technology, creativity, innovation, and agency. We thank you for putting the fire into our hearts to give us courage in this time, for putting the fire into our hearts so that we can get up in the morning and face the challenges that await us, for putting the passion and fire of love in our hearts so that we reach out to our neighbors who are in need and show up for them in the ways that our movements have so long espoused. We thank you for the technologies that make our lives easier and that at times save lives. And we are grateful for the warmth, the physical warmth in our homes that keeps us comfortable and safe that cooks our food, and also the warmth of love that we have between us as family members, as comrades, as siblings in this movement towards justice. Ashe. We turn our attention now upwards to the sky. Ago Oya, spirit of change, transformation, tornado and wind. Ago Agawu, who fills our lungs with breath and promises another day. Ago Sobo Bade, who crack the sky with lightning and thunder. Ago Osumare, who brings a rainbow after the storm to remind us that there will be calm again. We give thanks for our breathing and the breathing of those whom we love and those whom we would love if we could know them. We pray that we all have many, many more deep and healthy breaths and long life upon this earth. We give thanks to you for wiping away stagnancy, bringing transformation when needed and allowing us the opportunity to see this time of reset as an opening, a possibility, to implement our highest values of mutual aid and community care. Ashi. We reach now towards the earth. Ago Egungun, our ancestors, the ones who keep our stories for us, the rememberers. Ago Baron Samdi, Gere Nibo, Mama Brigitte the guardians of the souls of our forebears. We know that you have suffered, endured, and survived oppressions that we cannot imagine. Holocaust, slavery, lynching and terror, plague, famine, and still some of you had the fortitude to gather up seeds of okra, black rice, cow pea, and millet, and braid them into your hair as a gift for your descendants, even as you were forced into the bowels of slave ships, you saved your seed for us. And we pray that in this moment, you give us the courage and foresight to save and plant seeds for our descendants and to not give up. Ashe. And finally, we bring our hands to our hearts. And we say, Ago to our Ori, the spark of divinity inside of each of us, the little piece of the eternal that we carry in our own bodies. 
we say thank you for our intuition, our destiny, the clarity to discern truth from untruth and right from wrong. And we ask, Ori, that you strengthen the still clear voice within us in this time of so much noise and confusion and distraction. We ask that you help us to connect to all the forces we've named, to our ancestors, and to this inner truth so that we can make a path forward that is aligned with our highest values and the highest needs of the cherished siblings in this community. Ashe. At this time, we'll just leave a moment of silence if there's additional prayers of your heart that you want to say out loud or say silently inside of your minds. We'll just take a couple deep breaths together and then together we'll say Ashe three times. Ashe, Ashe, Asheo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah, for your beautiful prayers and offerings for grounding us here today. Um, we also want to add just a, a 30 second pause here um, to take a deep breath again. If you're able to relax your shoulders stretch whatever you need to be most comfortable right now as we get ready to move into the core framing portion of today. So I'm so excited to introduce my camarada for Movement Generation. Uh, Desiree Fontenot is a scholar, activist, and farmer. She's co-founder of People of Color Sustainable Housing Network and the Queer Ecologies Project. And Desi joined Movement Generation Collective almost two years ago. Joining Desi, Gopal Dayaneni, uh, who is one of the founding members of the MG Collective, and Movement Generation continues to be his political home. He now serves on the Movement Generation Planning Committee and his staff at the ETC group. Both of these group, uh, both of these folks have inspired my thinking and I hope you'll enjoy, join me in sending them love as they may feel the nerves of presenting to almost 3000 people uh, that they can't see right now. Welcome Desi and Gopal. Wow, thank you so much, Trey, for that introduction. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for being here with us today. Um, we're super excited to share our thinking and our reflections on this thus far. Um, and as Trey was saying, leading with a lot of humility, this comes from a, a long lineage of thought and work, and we're excited to add to it. and collectively move through with you all um, over the next four course sessions. Um, so we hope that this offering sparks deeper conversation and connection and collective action. Um, and with that said, let's get into it. Gopal, do you want to add anything else? Um, no, that's wonderful. I think we should dive right into it. The only thing I'll say is I am just really feeling blessed to be able to do this with you, Desi. I really admire Me you too. so much. And so I'm super excited to get to do it together. Me too. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Get situated here. Okay, so, all right, so I'm gonna start us off. Um, ecological context for pandemics. Just to note, each slide will have a Spanish interpretation on it um, in green. So, 
Um, to get us started, we'd like to begin by grounding in a shared understanding of what we mean by economy, especially as we unpack the ecological context for this moment. Um, because the massive ecological crisis we're in is truly rooted in an economic crisis, uh, getting at the root of those relationships is really important for us. And by doing that, we get at the root of the language of the word economy. Because um, in there, it has insights for us on what we need to remake our economy towards a just and livable future. So looking at the root word eco, eco comes from the Greek word oikos, which means home. And the word ecosystem, eco plus system, means all of the relationships of home. It's the many ways we've come to observe, to connect with um, the, the kin around us. Um, it's not simply a catalog of things that exist in a place, but more importantly, it's the relationships between and within those things. Um, an ecosystem can be as small as a raindrop or as large as the whole planet. It really depends on where you draw the, relation, draw the boundaries around those relationships of home. And then with that, the word eco plus logi, ecology, means the knowledge of home, the study of those relationships, the many ways we've come to observe the patterns and cycles and seasons and the feedbacks that shape ecosystems around us, the many ways of knowing. And then economy. Economy simply means the management of home, or another way to look at it is the care of home or stewardship of home. How we've come to organize our relationships in a place, ideally to take care of that place and each other. Economy isn't inherently financial markets or currency or trading or gross domestic product. Those activities are all tools of specific economies, right? Despite the constant narrative we get told that there is no alternative to the economy that we have now, we can and we have imagined many other economies um, and ways of moving in the world. All economies are nested within ecosystems. I mean that all economic activity has some ecological consequences for better or worse. Those consequences could be beneficial or they could be harmful. The economy um, we're in mediates our relationships to ecosystems. So when you globalize the economy, as we have, you globalize the ecosystem and thus the consequences of mismanaging home are globalized. Uh, we're going to look at the concept of feedback loops as a way of understanding the scale, pace, and intensity of how this one size must fit all economic model is at the root of many interlocking crises we're facing, including this current pandemic. So the dynamic between feedback, feedback loops are one aspect of what governs relationships in any complex system. So a feedback loop can either reinforce changes that occur in a system, accelerating that change and pushing it into more extreme conditions or, um, uh, yeah, we're pushing it into more extreme conditions or a feedback loop can balance changes that occur in a system, counteracting whatever direction of changes imposed on the system, usually moving it towards stability. A simple example is when you get cold, your body starts to shiver, um, creating a heating mechanism to bring you back into balance. Um, and there's many different examples on a planetary scale, and we could look at the, on the scale of the body in which feedback loops are constantly operating. Um, we currently have a throughput dynamic where our dominant economy completely ignores ecosystem feedbacks. It's working against the balancing feedback loops of Earth systems and reinforcing planetary feedbacks that ultimately constrict the life-sustaining functions of the planet. 
So we're basically forcing our Earth system to seek balance in more extreme and amplified ways. In an economy that's not responding to ecological feedbacks will eventually collapse. Right? You can extract from a finite system faster than the capacity of that system to regenerate. So we're going to look at how this is playing out in our current crisis, and we'll continue to come back to this framing of feedback loops. All right, so we're gonna um, try something a little different. Um, and so the 1500 people who are participating in the Zoom get to participate in a Zoom poll. Um, so the question we've put forward for you is where do you think SARS-CoV-2 came from? So um, SARS-CoV-2, which most people um, are probably aware is the particular coronavirus that is um, causes COVID-19, which is the disease that comes from it, um, the illness that comes from it. And we're probably hearing in the, uh, in the news many different stories about all the possible um, places that um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, emerged from. So um, this is your chance to vote. So the poll should be appearing for you. And um, you just choose the number that it goes with. And we're Can people hear me now? Wow, folks can hear me now. Okay, um, I have no idea where I wasn't heard, so um, I'll go back. So everybody should be voting in the poll on where they, um, what they've heard and where they think um, the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus came from. Um, it, there have been stories about it being from a wet market in Wuhan, from the exotic animal trade, there have been some claims that it came from a biotech lab. There have been a few stories about the relationship between deforestation and, and the emergen, emergen, um, uh, emergence of viruses. Um, and of course, there's been stories about industrial agriculture and particularly um, uh, industrial meat production. So we're gonna test out the poll and we're going to give folks a minute to vote. And I can see that it says hosts and panelists can't vote. Desi, mm -hmm. do you know when yeah. the poll closes, or does, is that up to Ellen? I think that I think that's up to Ellen. Right. Why don't we give folks about? 30 more seconds to vote. Don't spend too much time thinking about it. Spoiler alert, the answer isn't that important. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. The results are in. Oh, the results are in. Okay. So let's, um, where do we see the results? How do we see this? Um, it just popped up on my screen. I'll read it out loud. 25% uh, of folks picked number one, wet market in Wuhan. 10% picked number two, exotic animal trade. 8% picked number three. 33% picked deforestation, number four. And 25% uh, picked number five, industrial agriculture. Great. Okay, excellent. Thank you. That's um, super interesting and revealing um, from uh, what what uh, what people are 
are thinking about and experiencing. Um, so the first thing we want to say is, um, and thank you for, for doing that. Um, the first thing we want to start with is actually it's really the wrong question. Um, this idea of um, focusing on um, where the where the uh, the pin trying to pinpoint where the virus emer emerges from is in some ways distracting us from the more important question, the more important line of inquiry inquiry, which is what are the processes that create sites of emergence in the first place. It is actually very possible that it could be a wet market in Wuhan, which is certainly potentially related to the exotic animal trade, which is certainly related to deforestation and, and industrial agriculture. There isn't a lot of evidence that this particular um, uh, virus came from a biotech lab, but given the amount of investment in biotech research and in bioweapons, particularly in the United States, it's not a completely absurd conjecture. All that being said, what's really more important than trying to figure out the specific um, place it comes from is to understand the processes that create so many sites of emergence in the first place. The explosive growth of accumulated wealth in a growing middle class in China has made the once niche market of exotics worth tens of billions of dollars, increasing pressure on biodiversity. That is capital spilling over and causing disease spillover. Massive land grabs and deforestation creating pressure on forest ecosystems and putting domesticate, um, and domesticated uh, animal operations and human communities in closer proximity to non-domesticated species causes spillover. And the erosion of genetic diversity through um, the corporate concentration of livestock, a loss of livestock genetic diversity creates greater vulnerability to, um, to spillovers from wild animals into domesticated species. So all of these are potential sources and all of them are driven by um, common underlying processes, which are flows of capital. It's the capital flows that are driving the emergence of disease. Um, so we'll move to the next one. Yeah, and so um, you might see a lot of maps that try to pinpoint the hot spots of where um, a novel disease emergence come from. But what we're really interested in is looking at what those underlying drivers are. Most pandemics, HIV, AIDS, Ebola, West Nile, SARS, Lyme disease, and hundreds more have their roots in environmental changes and ecosystems disturbances. At least 60% of the novel human pathogens emerge by spilling from wild animals into local human populations. And if we focus on where that's happening and not what's underlying, what the underlying drivers are, we end up missing the opportunity to intervene where we really need to. And when you look at this map, some of the major um, uh, hot spots of, uh, of capital concentration, they also result in high concentrations of human communities. So you see capital flows, concentrations of capital from wealth extracted from the living world and labor. That concentration creates um, the conditions by which more and more people are forced to migrate to where that capital is concentrated to make their livelihoods, whether it's Mumbai or New York. And those then become even greater concentrations and high density environments where, um, where these um, diseases then spread. And that's what we're seeing in Mumbai today and what we've seen in New York already. So we wanna leave you with that really important idea that you only ever experience the living world or nature, which is a complicated idea in and of itself, through the economy that we're in. And an inequitable economy will always inequitably distribute the consequences of, of, those, you know, of those experiences. It doesn't matter whether it's an earthquake or whether it's climate change or whether it's a pandemic.
to move to the next slide. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so we we threw this one in because we thought it was a fun, nice little explanation of that whole idea. <laughs> So looping back to the idea of feedback loops, um, we're going to take a deeper look at this current moment through this framing and walk through what this reinforcing feedback loop that creates pandemics looks like. Um, so capital flows, um, what sets this all in motion? Uh, we like this image because it's the corporate handshake is both the symbol and the vector of transmission, these transactional negotiations with the wealth of the living world. Um, and we're using that phrase because what is capital really if not the enclosure of land and labor, right? Um, and we wanted to say in starting this off, the spread of disease through these settler colonial ideologies and practices isn't anything new. It's the predictable consequence of empire building. We've seen it again and again. Um, to give some recent context to this, since 2008, more than 138 million acres of land has been purchased in the global south by international companies. Um, Spanish translation. Um, so then we have the deployment of this capital um, to bring about immense habitat destruction. Um, the destruction of complex ecosystems that keeps virulent pathogen population growth in check um, is happening at an intense scale and pace. So to give y'all a sense of this scale, um, the scale of the violation of the integrity of both species and ecosystems, I wanted to share a few facts. So three quarters of all land on this planet has been either turned into farm fields, covered by concrete, swallowed up by dam reservoirs, or otherwise significantly altered. Two thirds of the marine environment has also been changed by fish farms, shipping routes, subsea mines or some other projects, and three quarters of all our rivers and lakes are used for industrial crop or livestock cultivation. The acceleration of this destruction has meant that over the past 50 years, at least 300 new pathogens have emerged or re-emerged and are circulating amongst uh, our, our human populations as habitats are destroyed and manipulated for profit. Um, and further as a result of this, this means more than a million species are at risk of extinction. All of this uh, is to make way for the expansion of monocultures. I'll first talk about monocultures in the literal sense, the uh, agricultural, industrial agricultural practice of growing one crop or one animal in one huge area, um, growing genetic monocultures where food, food animals and plants have nearly ide identical genomes means that we're removing the natural immune fire breaks that come in more diverse populations and diverse ecosystems um, that would slow down transmission. Um, so while, the, while this globalized industrial food system accounts for most land use changes worldwide, other aspects of what we're calling this monocultural expansion also looks like logging and mining and rapid urbanization, including a growing shift from rural to very peri-urban landscapes. More and more folks are being driven to this, these high density environments. And they're becoming extremely hard to navigate in this moment. Diseases that would have otherwise burned out when most people lived more agrarian lifestyles now reaches many people very quickly. Um, over 50% of the human population live in highly concentrated urban centers like this. Um, and this model of development, it's based on a worldview that tells us that endless growth and consumption is possible for everyone. It's a belief system that we might call monocultures of the mind um, from Vandana Shiva. It's the idea that we can have one assimilated world culture 
when truly monocultures leave us um, the most vulnerable to crisis. Um, it would do us well to remember that this model for the development of prosperity is based on prosperity that was born out of displacement, enslavement, and massive extraction. And something that we have to reckon with is that if everyone can't have this type of development, no one should have this kind of development, including those of us living in rich, overdeveloped countries. So when you have the concentrations of human beings seen as units of production, highly close together, interconnected through water systems and transportation systems and trade systems, all of those become eventual vectors for transmission. Um, which brings us to the globalized networks of travel and trade that this moves on. Um, these networks rely on highly mechanized capital and technology intensive um, operations to move goods around the world. Excuse They're, me, Desiree, this is Andrina, uh, one of the interpreters. Can you please go back to the information up to the beginning of this slide and please slow, speak slower. Thank you so much. Yes, no problem. Um, so I was, what a, to resummarize, this brings us to the globalized networks of travel and trade um, that rely on highly mechanized capital and technology intensive networks to move goods around the world to us. These growing global trade and also livestock trade networks deliver the pathogens from cities that we just talked about to the rest of the world in record time. And this image uh, kind of shows the precarity of these systems. And that brings us to pandemics. And this is Gopal again. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. It looks like it's working. Um, so we want to now um, talk a little bit about pandemics. And we're going to start by actually looking at that word for a moment, pandemic, pan meaning all, and demos meaning people or citizen. So pandemic is something that affects all people. Um, and we want a, a little digression for a moment. We need to remember that people, the term, the idea of people and person is a political Term. It's a political idea. And while we all intuitively have a sense that when we say all people, we mean all human persons, we know already that we have lived in a society and have lived in societies in which who gets to be people is very much a political idea. Not, not all humans have been given, um, have been recognized as persons. And we live in an economy now where corporations have all of the rights and privileges of personhood. And we know that we come from peoples and traditions and histories in which the notion of personhood has extended to the trees and forests and rivers, well captured in the, in the expression, all our relations. So the recognition that the quote unquote personhood of living systems actually does matter when how we think about our relationships to each other, to ecosystems, and in fact, to the economy. Um, at a minimum, you know, um, or actually what we should expect from the notion of personhood is a sense of sacredness, a sense of deep and abiding value, um, or at a minimum in the context of the world that we're in now, rights-bearing entities. And in that context, mm -hmm. and in that context, we want to, um, to expand our understanding of the notion of pandemics so that we open our eyes to seeing the other kinds of pandemics that are, that have, that are upon us in this moment, that are all reflections of this, um, this process. Um, so for example, we have been living in for, um, for a decade now, at least, 
um, a pandemic for the oak trees in um, for the oak in California. Um, the sudden oak death is um, is a pandemic um, that is the result of a phytophthora that is co-evolved with an ancient ancestor of the oak in Asia, and that through this process has made its way to California and is now um, also in, um, in parts of Europe and the UK and are decimating um, our, um, uh, the coastal oaks. Um, it's changing, it's the sudden oak death is changing the ecology of our coastal forests um, it's, um, which is essential to our water filtration, to nutrient cycling, to carbon soil, to soil formation. And if we had, if, if we understood the oak as kin, we could see it as the pandemic that it is, that does actually affect all of us, all people, beginning with, in this case, the most vulnerable the oak to this um, to this process, and we all know this. We all experience this all the time. We can tell countless stories and countless experiences of all of the unique ways in or the particular ways in which these kinds of um, these kinds of quote unquote pandemics are are propagating and plaguing the planet. Which brings us to our next slide, which is the expansion of markets and profits in crisis. And um, folks will be very familiar with our comrade and friend um, Naomi Klein's work on disaster capitalism and the shock doctrine. And we are, um, of course, we'll talk more about this um, in a little bit, but we are seeing in this moment um, these moments of crises becoming huge opportunities for profiteering um, and the same companies that have created these crises are now um, profiting off of both claiming to, um, to um, provide the solutions, but also through their ongoing corporate concentration and, um, and mega mergers and connections that we don't normally think of. We don't normally uh, notice that big pharma is deeply integrated into big ag and that the biotech industry, for example, has um, consolidated interests across health um, as well as agriculture, as well as biodiversity and conservation, and that they're all coming together. And um, I just want to make a particular point about the disaster capitalism in this moment. Um, our, our folks at um, inequality.org just put out um, uh, a report on um, pandemic profiteers. And since January 2020, Jeff Bezos of Amazon has made $25 billion just since January. That's more than the entire gross domestic product of Honduras. I, there's no other way to describe that besides just evil. It's just wrong. And um, we've seen the top billionaires in the U.S. have increased their wealth by 10% over 2019 so far. And at the same time that we have unprecedented unemployment and joblessness. So this is the perfect example of the kind of disaster capitalism we're experiencing right now. And that is actually accelerating the problem. It is not simply taking advantage of the fact that people are, are sheltered in place. It is the massive acceleration of, of the problem, which brings us, which brings us back to, um, the, the, the final step here in this um, uh, pandemic feedback loop that, that continues to um, grow this process, which is um, this wealth concentration is then used for greater enclosure of land and labor, more land grabbing, um, uh, whether it's in Africa, Asia, Latin America, or gentrification in the US. The, the, the massive land grabbing that's fed through this extraction of wealth 
And every step of this process, we accelerate the cycle, and that's what leads to mass extinction and the cascade failure of the biosphere if we don't intervene. Next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna take um, a couple moments now to um, talk about a couple of specific um, aspects of the, the sort of false promises, the sort of other part of our disaster capitalism framework. And um, I wanna talk about, um, there's many things that we can look at right now, but um, I'm interested in bringing in some of the the wisdom and learning that um, that um, I've been I've been engaging in with with the folks at ETC Group. Um, I want to start by something that um, we say at ETC, um, which stands for um, which is the Action Group on Erosion, Technology, and Corporate Concentration. We note that any sufficiently high leverage technology developed and deployed in an unequal society will almost certainly exacerbate that inequality. And just because we are in a crisis doesn't make it any less true. I think it's important for us to notice that in this moment, a process that's been taking place for some time is being rapidly accelerated, which we can think of or talk about as a kind of new platform supremacy, the Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, or from the China side, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and Xiaomi. These are the big data platforms that we are all being forced into a greater dependency on. And they are not just neutral uh, platforms that we can use for whatever we feel like. They have embedded in them assumptions um, and, um, and, and values and interests that are not our own. Um, and this is one of the, 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 the biggest shifts that we see or accelerations that we see happen. This, of course, has been happening for a long time. But COVID-19 has opened up, um, has become sort of um, the charismatic, charismatic justification for accelerating the sort of data surveillance in the name of contact tracing that suggests that if we could track every movement, movement every moment, every interaction, that we can then have all of the information we need to, um, to fight th this virus. But what's really happening is a massive acceleration of the collection of that data to mine it for valuable information, to nudge us ever more precisely into the preferred patterns and practices um, that serve the interests of these platforms and their um, and um, and the capitalist um, interests. From what we eat to what we watch, they can subtly entice us into thinking that we're making their choices for ourselves. And of course, this isn't new, but we're seeing a much, much bigger push for this justified in the name of public health. And we don't actually need it. The most effective contact tracing work that's been done outside of, um, outside of China has been in places where they've used more um, traditional methods or, com or, or combined methods of traditional social networks are actually going out and um, reaching people, such as in Iceland. Um, so then I'll move to the next slide. There's also, of course, a big push for the idea that the biotech industry will save us, that, they're, that they are claiming that they'll put everything they have into finding us a vaccine or a cure, when in fact, throughout all of this time, they have continued to, um, it, um, to pursue patents in agriculture and in um, medicine, and that their biggest applications are in the control of biodiversity and land and seed. 
But what we're actually seeing is something that's been in the works for a bit that seems to be getting a lot of attention and greater acceleration in this moment, which is this notion of a fourth industrial revolution. There's a, this is the idea of the convergence of big data, robotics, biotechnology, um, uh, all converging together through the internet of things in health, in agriculture, in food systems, in every aspect of our daily lives. And through this internet of things, through the, through the mining of every aspect of our daily lives, this fourth industrial revolution promises to, produce, to reproduce everything we have through the extractive economy, just more efficiently, more quickly, more energy efficiently, um, making invisible, of course, the true back end of all these technologies, which is the exploitation of labor, the mining of resources, um, and um, and the erosion of living systems. So, hi, go a lot this is Marianela. Just a reminder to please slow down. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. I need them and appreciate them. So, while there's a lot of chatter about silver linings and um, and um, the, the things that we're experiencing in terms of reduced greenhouse gas emissions or air pollution, um, we have to remember that, um, that there's actually a whole hidden, um, like a, a hidden back end to all of these technologies that are being hailed as helping us travel less and, and, um, and work remotely and all of these things. Um, and that we have to actually be ex examining and unpacking and looking for those. Um, and there are positive externalities, meaning unpredicted consequences of this pandemic that we do want to uplift, like all of the mutual aid that's been happening. Um, uh, but it's important for us to also look at what's being moved forward in this moment of, of um, crisis. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I think guys. it's time for our stretch break. Yep. I'm going to hand it over to Trey. Um, okay, there we go. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you so much, Jesse and Gopal, for bringing us this far. Uh, once again, for those who are just tuning in, my name is Trey Vasquez, also known as Raspado Rules with Movement Generation. Uh, I'm your humble MC for today's session. Uh, just want to give a big, big shout out to our interpreters as well, who are working hard right now to make sure uh, this session is accessible to all folks. Uh, to our uh, graphic person who's also uh, drawing this session. Uh, and to all of you who are tuning in, I'm seeing we, we have folks from South Carolina, from Denver, Richmond, Oakland, Tacoma, uh, Mexico City, DF, Costa Rica, Santa Fe, Puerto Rico, Argentina, Alaska, and the list goes on. Uh, really exciting uh, that folks are here and representing. Um, we are about to move into a three minute stretch break here so that we can go ahead and take care of our needs, stretch, grab a snack, use the restroom, whatever you need to do. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to let you all know something really exciting, which was mentioned earlier in our welcome, that when we started the process of designing this course, we had no idea what the response was going to be like. Um, but as we started to see the uh, interest from Community Rise, we realized that we were going to need a bigger platform. This morning, we had roughly 3,000 folks registered for this course. And fortunately, our FAM at New Economy Coalition supported us and letting us use their Zoom account. Uh, but we needed to add an upgrade to have the capacity to host everyone today from all the places and beyond that we named. So in the spirit of reciprocity, we'd like to give back to New Economy Coalition for making today possible. Uh, so we ask for folks that are able to out there to make a donation today at neweconomycoalition.net forward slash donate. And this info is also going to be available on the break slide coming up in just a second here. Uh, once again, thank you all. Take this next three minutes to take care of yourself and we will be coming back to go Paul and Desi.
All right, looks like we're going to start coming back now. If you can hear me, you're like any other room away from your computer. I'm going to start sitting back down and we're going to um, do another 20 minutes or so of presenting and then we're going to jump into our Q&A session. Okay. Go ahead and share my screen. Right. Okay. So as a springboard for thinking about where we go from here, we wanted to get the imagination juices flowing on just embracing the sheer complexity of this time and this place and this planet that we're on. Um, a lot of us tend to rush towards strategy and uh, we're hoping that this activity will give us some time to just sit back and um, think about the complexities that the, the hidden world allows us to, to swim in. Um, so uh, to do this, uh, we're gonna take a look at this image first. This is usually what we imagine or what we're taught when we think about biodiversity, the big flora and fauna that we easily relate to, that's very charismatic, but rarely do we think of the diversity of the hidden world. Ooh, microbes. Um, <laughs> if, um, yeah, so if, if uh, just to, to, to sit on that a little bit, um, more than half of our human body is made up of microbial cells. The other half being what we imagine as human cells, but just thinking about that, what makes us 
individuals is actually a bunch of different systems nested within other systems um, that, uh, that makes life possible. Um, so we wanted to do a little activity that gets at some of the hidden world complexities that pathogens present to us and start to think about what does it look like to move into right relationship, not just with the cute megafauna and flora that we're used to, but also right relationships with the microbial life and the unseen life that um, is deeply embedded in the feedback cycles of the living planet and that make um, us possible in so many ways. Uh, so to do that, uh, we're going to borrow from something that I've been doing at MG retreats and workshops lately, which is bringing in this piece around queer ecology, um, except this time, I'm calling it the pathogen edition. So uh, queer ecology, it's a lens that I use on a lot of the folks I'm in community use for exploring the vast and seemingly endless variations of life on this planet. There's so many different forms of embodiment from size, appearance, ability, sex and gender variation, different reproductive strategies, uh, to different forms of kinship, to care systems, to bonding, to affection and uh, community, right? There's so many different ways that we have made meaning of ourselves and the relatives around us and within us. Um, and it's very greatly across cultures and places. So with that, we're gonna turn this lens on the hidden world with a little quiz. Um, how this is gonna work, we're gonna do another poll I'm going to embody or personify uh, each one of these organisms you see before you. And y'all are going to guess who you think I am based on the kind of relationality that I'm describing uh, that I'm all about. Okay? So, Ellen, if you want to pull up the first poll. And let me see. I don't know if it'll come up for me, so just think, all right, there it goes. Okay, cool. All right. Um, gonna move this thing. Okay, so first one. I'm often around living on the skin or in your mouth or your throat or your gut or in your vagina, and most of the time I'm there without causing anyone any trouble. But if I grow out of control, I can transform from a harmless Slow down. Is that what? I'm... Oh, okay. I just heard a little noise. Sorry. If I grow out of control, I can transform from a harmless microbe into a deadly pathogen. Like many one-celled organisms, I prefer the less energy-intensive process of asexual reproduction. But on the rare occasion, I can reproduce sexually in or on my host. Who am I? Who do you think this uh, organism is that has some consent questions around uh, reproduction? <laughs> um, so I'll give folks like 30 seconds to put in your vote and then we'll reveal. Do, do, do. I feel like we need a little Jeopardy music. <laughs> okay, let's close the poll and reveal. I am up. It is, let's see, 22% of folks got it right. I am the fungal yeast known as Candida albicans, one of the most common fungal. Uh, friends living with us that sometimes causes infections. The next one, I am a little ball of proteins and genetic material. I come in many different strains. I have no cells. I need to use another cell structure to reproduce. One strain of me was responsible for the 1918 pandemic. 
Another strain caused a, a 2009 pandemic. And I still circulate and mutate new strains every year. Who am I? Desiree, this is Andreina speaking. We're having technical difficulties yes. on the Spanish line due to oh, some participants not being able to silence their phone. So right now, mm. um, we are not quite sure how to deal with, we've tried muting all participants and unmuting, but it doesn't seem to be working. So meanwhile, oh, no. folks are um, thinking, give us a few minutes to try to resolve this issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll just take a couple more seconds to vote. Okay, let's close the poll. And see. Oh, almost uh, this time, 41% of folks got it right. It was number four, um, an H1N1 influenza virus, which comes in many different strains and has lots of different lineages that um, become more and more diverse every year for a lot of the reasons we named in the beginning. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of the quiz just for time's sake, and hopefully we'll uh, work out the, the kinks on the, the Spanish line. Apologies again for, for the technical difficulties. We're all learning and experimenting here. Okay, so third one. I'm the most common vector-borne disease in the U.S. I'm caused by a bacteria that passes through the salivary glands of my tiny yet plentiful vectors and into the animals that they feed on. I reproduce asexually through a cell division process called binary fission. And there's one lizard in the Western uh, part of the country that has a protein that kills my bacteria and cleanses the vector of me. Who am I? We have dwindling choices, and y'all might be saying things out loud, but you don't know what it looks like. So um, this is the opportunity to get um, get visually familiar with with it. I'll give a couple more seconds for this one. We do no options, and let's close the poll. The answer is, oh, a lot of folks thought it was number six. It was number three. This uh, bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, otherwise known as the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, the most common vector-borne disease in the U.S. A couple more. Um, next one. I'm the longest parasite in the world, stretching 130 feet. I have both masculine and feminine reproductive parts. So I fertilize my own eggs. I lay them in the intestines of my host. And then I, that host poops them out. Another host eats them. Something eats that host. And then my eggs are released in those intestines and I develop into an adult. Who am I? This one might be the most visually uh, obvious. We'll see. <laughs> couple more seconds and we'll close the poll yes number one the tapeworm this is actually a whale tapeworm this is the largest tapeworm in the world that lives inside of sperm whales um, and then the last two this will be the last poll and I'll just read the last one so this one, I'm one of the world's most common parasites. I'm infamously found in litter boxes. It's rumored that I may slow my host reaction time, making those hosts more vulnerable to cat attacks. Who am I? Okay, 
I'm just going to give like two more seconds for this one. Okay, we'll close it. Yes, number six, 72% of folks guess right. It is uh, toxoplasmosis, which I'm pretty sure that I have. Um, <laughs> and um, I wanted to add this one just to think about the ways that the unseen affects our behaviors in ways that we may not know. And again, it is just one or two studies that think that this makes everyone slower, but it's still something that happens often in nature and other dynamics. And then the last one is what brought us all together on this webinar today. I am the third virus of my type in the last two decades to cause multiple epidemics. I am named for the crown-like spikes protruding from my surfaces. I'm new to your species. Unlike the host I've co-evolved with, you have built little immunity to me. And there's still a lot that you just don't know about me. And that is SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. So I hope that quiz was fun for you all. It's, it's usually really fun doing this as a live audience, so I hope it was engaging. But at the core of it, I wanted to share this so that we can hold some humility for the vast complexity of this planet as we try to right our relationships and restore balance to the web of life that we're all a part of. Hey, Desi, so with that, yes. This is Ellen. Um, we're still, uh, we're getting messages that the Spanish line is still having some issues. So do you mind us taking a little pause? And sure, sure. yeah, let's take a little pause. Uh, is I'll turn on um, Yuki. If you could turn on your video, we can show you for a little while while we um, have the see if we can get the Spanish line back up and play this by ear. Cool. Thanks, y'all. Just let us know when you want to switch again. Mm -hmm. Hi all, thank you. This is Andreina speaking, the interpreter. We are ready to go. Beautiful. All right, Desi, are you great? Yes. Yeah, I will um, share my screen again. Okay. All right, so with that, we're going to move into our last section here, and then we'll jump into Q&A. And I'll hand it to you, Gopal. Great. Um, I'm just going to um, offer a quick little bit of framing as we think about, um, as we set ourselves up, not just for this session, but for um, the coming sessions of this um, course correction, it's where we're learning by doing. Um, we wanted to um, really, like one of the, um, really powerful things about um, diversity and complexity and complex systems like living systems is um, that there are not simple fix, fix solutions for complex problems in complex systems. Um, and that in fact, because of, because of the complex and the, 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 um, the just the sheer volume of um, of interrelated feedbacks and dynamics that are happening. Um, instead of thinking that we're going to find some simple fix that will, um, uh, in a sort of very, very simple cause and effect way, solve the problems before us, we have to recognize and embrace um, the complexity of the systems we're grappling with. And that doesn't mean we don't need strategy, and it doesn't mean that there aren't, um, uh, there aren't um, s solutions for many of the challenges that we face. Um, and in fact, the kinds of interventions we make will change the conditions to make other interventions more possible. But we want to hold with humility, not just the awe and the complexity of the living world, but what it means to try and um, grapple with um, systems change and transformation. So um, 
we want to just um, just share this this idea that you know complex problems take strategic interventions that change conditions and create new opportunities, and we are in a moment in which we can make strategic interventions that can change the conditions, and we have to be creative about it, and we have to recognize that they may not be perfect, but they will at least disrupt the the um, the dynamics of the system or they can disrupt the dynamics of the system enough to give us opportunities for new interventions and, and, um, and new kinds of change to happen. Um, so we just want to put that forward because um, it's easy to, in this moment, to be like, this is our chance to get everything we want or to do, um, you know, to find some, um, you know, to want a simple explanation for everything. But we have to actually... Um, kind of grapple with and lean into just the scale and complexity of the challenges. And so with that, we're going to offer a framework to help us that's going to guide us in the next sessions to think through um, how we can start to, um, to um, imagine those kinds of interventions. Desi? Cool. All right. So um, so, if we're ultimately trying to shift the purpose of our economy to be for the social and ecological well-being of all of our relatives, um, the question that we're asking is, what are some of the feedback loops that we're going to need uh, to balance against um, the, the ones that are destroying uh, land, life, and labor, and the web of life that we're all a part of? Um, so this feedback loop piece is, um, uh, Escopolisane will be elaborated on in subsequent sessions. The next three sessions are going to be very much focused on unpacking a lot of the ideas and themes that I'm going to go through here a little more quickly. Um, but just to give y'all a flavor or a sense of some of the strategic interventions that us and lots of our comrades here and on this call and all over are playing with. Um, let's look at what what aspects of a feedback loop um, that we want to con continue creating that we want um, to move in. So, social and ecological well-being is what we are setting in motion. Um, and one of the main things we need to do to move that is to center and uh, recognize indigenous knowledge systems and leadership, um, particularly thinking about uh, what traditional ecological knowledge represents in that. It represents economies in which the ecological and economic feedbacks are aligned and also codified in culture, in language, and in worldview and have been for centuries. Um, biodiversity is richest on indigenous managed lands. And while indigenous people today make up less than 5% of the world's population and use a quarter of the world's land surfaces, they protect over 80% of global biodiversity on this planet. Um, similarly, uh, thinking about peasant food webs and how this overlaps, peasant and indigenous food webs overlaps with that factoid I just shared is that um, peasant food webs use less than 25% of all agricultural lands, but they grow, but they grow food that nourishes more than 70% of the world population. How do we amplify this and understand that this evolved knowledge of place held by indigenous communities and peasant food webs is key to our resilience? Um, This goes uh, hand in hand with protecting and promoting biocultural diversity. Um, we like to say diversity assures resilience and diversity is our best defense. Um, uh, what this means biocultural diversity to us is that cultural and biological diversity are inextricably linked. Wherever one finds richness in bio biodiversity, one can also expect to find a great number of distinct languages and distinct cultures. So knowing that when you displace culture, you endanger ecosystems and vice versa is incredibly important in moving forward and also in remembering our way forward 
um, especially as folks who go, have grown up on this side of the global economy where uh, maintaining uh, ecosystem complexity isn't a part of our everyday relationships necessarily. Um, so in that, uh, the work that we need to do is not only in protecting the existing biocultural diversity of the world, but also promoting new webs of connection. Um, and that's where bioregional governance come in, comes in. So uh, the entire third session of this series is going to unpack this concept of bioregional governance. Um, but at its core, it's about rethinking our relationships, um, not simply redesigning the map, of how we do things, but fundamentally rethinking our relationship to our food sheds, our trade sheds, our water sheds, our fiber sheds. Um, it's about reimagining the nature of governance in bioregional terms, moving us out of arbitrary political borders to more fluid ecological boundaries that are defined by seasons and patterns and cultures. Translation. I'll try to do the translations for the whole slide at the end here. Um, and then lastly, embedded in all of these is the process of healing and reparations. Um, and reparations to us means repairing all our relationships with each other and with the web of life that we're a part of. Um, and it's, it's such a, a deep part that moves this whole piece forward, right? Because um, healing and reparations for over 500 years of colonialism and slavery upon which every bit of wealth accumulated since then has been derived has to be key for us. And it's not just about amending past harms, but it's about reorganizing the very nature of our economy so as to create new relationships moving forward. Um, new relationships across movements, across species, from within our goat culture to all of the places that we call home. Um, and that will lead to more social and ecological well-being. And we're going to dive into more of these um, throughout our time together, but I'm going to leave it at that, and we're going to move into our Q&A portion. And uh, if it's helpful, I could leave this up for a minute. I'll, wait, I'll let our moderator decide, MC decide. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Desi and Gopal, uh, for bringing forward your mm -hmm. insight and knowledge around this. It's such a powerful conversation looking at this complex moment that we're in right now and how we as people can continue leading in deep interventions and building real solutions together as communities who are most impacted by climate disasters and all the ways uh, that continue to ripple out. So as we're talking about the many layers within this moment and what the past can look like going forward, we know that there's a lot of questions and thoughts that are coming up. We see the Q&A box has just been going strong this entire time. Um, and so we want to uplift some of the questions that were raised um, during the time that y'all were presenting uh, and give an opportunity to speak to some of those things. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with the, with the first question, if y'all are ready, um, which is a combination of questions uh, from folks like uh, Shalini Pamal and Mikaela Frudley. Um, can you talk more about navigating the contradictions of this pandemic, where communities of color have deep medical mistrust, rightfully so, where big pharma is set to profit from a vaccine? How do we reconcile public health and medicine in a more conscious narrative to heal communities? Do we still encourage people to take the vaccine when it's available, or is there an alternative solution? Mm. You want to go first? Yeah. Um, I could use a little mental break to absorb. Sure. Thank you for the question. You know, just small questions. Yeah. We got. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Trey, for uh, making that the first question. Um, I'll start. Um, I do think there that um, part of navigate. You know, part of transition is navigating the contradictions. Like there's, it is would be ridiculous to suggest that we should not. Um, 
I don't know if ridiculous is the right word, but I, I personally would not suggest that we not take advantage, that we not utilize the infrastructure at our disposal to address the immediate harm and hurting that's happening. What we also need to um, take advantage of in this moment is the opportunity to intervene in how those processes come to be and who controls them. The way the way a healthcare system that was predicated on cost cutting and profit making has um, made us ill-equipped to respond to the moment, I think is one of the big lessons here. Um, can I be, could, could you all hear me? Was that, was that coming through? Okay, there was, I was frozen for a second. I wanna speak to the vaccine question. Um, you know, I am not against um, uh, vaccines or the science of vaccines personally. That's not the issue for me. The corporate concentration, control, and profit making off of how we address issues of health corrupts the science to the point where it's reasonable for people to have doubts about it. And that's not because I think you know, I'm not saying that the I don't have an issue with the um, with the the understanding of how it works. I have an issue with the fact that, that they get propagated for the purpose of profit making and not for health. And if we really want to um, to you know, a vaccine is sort of like a band aid on this situation. If we really want to avoid the kinds of spillover that we experience on an ongoing basis, then we have to address the underlying issues and engage in the question of, are we going to control um, industry, ag um, agriculture, land grabbing? I mean, the other thing that's being so transparently revealed is the precarity of the industrial food system that doesn't even feed that many people on the planet. And so I think what's what this moment offers is the opportunity to see all those things. Um, but yeah, I I um, was sick and I had a um, a COVID test, and I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't take care of ourselves um, uh, in any way. But to understand how our capacity to take care of ourselves is deeply compromised by the way in which the economy mediates our access to basic needs like healthcare that, um, you know, that even the vaccine will travel the well-worn paths of inequality um, in the economy if we do not intervene in how they come to be and how they get distributed. I don't know if that was a helpful answer at all to a very, very hard first question. Super helpful. Thank you all for stepping into that one. Did, did you want to add anything, Daisy? Um, yeah, something that comes up for me in that question, uh, in prepping for this, we talked about, like, just the, the contradictions of, like, what, what it would look like, what healthcare for all has to look like down the line if we're really talking about um, redistributing wealth and power. Um, across the globe because our medical system a lot of it is um, based on like extracting life expectancy from the global south to the global north and i think that like that's that's one of the biggest contradictions that comes up for me because if we are talking about uh, we can't all have this infinite level of development that um, we've been moving towards in the in the economy we have what does it actually look like to redistribute, uh, not only redistribute access to the um, technological intensive interventions that we have, but also to um, rethink and reimagine what prevention looks like, what uh, thriving altogether looks like, um, rather than relying on a system that is built to work at the last minute um, and to use a lot of um, industrial manufacturing to respond to crisis, right? So 
that's something that came up for me. I hope that's helpful to the folks who asked that question. And um, it's sort yeah. of it's the it, what we what we talked about as the uh, as the um, the low volume, high margin healthcare economy, rather than the high volume of meeting people's needs with at, at very little cost. And that comes for preventative health care, food is medicine, and so much more. Great. Thank you all. Um, as you can tell, we have some really deep, well-thought-out questions. So definitely appreciate hearing your thoughts on this. Uh, this next question is uh, coming from Pancho uh, Ramos. How can we create, restore habits, ritual in a post-COVID-19 where we can be more in a more intimate relation with the essence of Mother Earth and the magnificence of the cosmos. Mm. Trey, is there a place where we could read the questions too? That would help me in responding. Sure, I could go ahead. I see and the translation that. over there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. I have, is it in the chat? Sorry. <laughs> or maybe you could repeat it one more time. Sure. Let, let me do that. It's uh, how can we create and restore habits, oh, ritual in a post COVID-19 where we can be more in more intimate relation with the essence of the mother earth and the magnificence of the cosmos. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, in the, I know you said in a post COVID-19, um, and I, I guess that that point sticks out to me because I feel like this, this pandemic and future ones could, um, just really determine uh, what a culture shift looks like and our cultural work looks like um, for a long time. Um, and I think that uncertainty is uh, maybe in that question in some way with, with what, do we, what do we do after this moment? Um, uh, but I, you know, I think there's so many different examples of, um, community care and healing work um, here in the Bay and around the world that uh, just speak to the, the, the creativity of um, our folks and, and finding different ways to uh, maintain connection with each other, um, with our values, with our sense of intimacy. Um, even the way Leah opened us up today, like I just felt so much more open after that moment and connected to you all, even though it's mediated through this screen experience um, and holding that. Um, yeah, I also I'm like, let me think a little bit more on it. Gopal, do you wanna to I'll, add stuff and maybe yeah, I'll add yeah, more I, something? Something that really has been um, has been alive for me in the last um, you know 10 12 weeks is what I've been seeing from um, social movements in the global south and particularly um, in agroecology and um, and peasant um, farmer organizing um, through my work with ETC group is the incredible mm -hmm. capacity for communities to who control their own labor and are able to self-organize to meet their um, needs in their community as a community. So mm -hmm. the, the collective work, I'm not talking about the individual mm -hmm. uh, work, the collective work to be able to respond in this moment by creating like in the Philippines, um, um, uh, uh, peasant organizations who are creating food and uh, care, you know, mutual aid, um, uh, infrastructure that to me is a ritual is is ritualizing care and compact like it is a public mm -hmm. manifestation of love and care it is all the people that I see around me who are 
caring about the soil and doing it with their family and even with their friends. Like we mm -hmm. can, we can, we can be in the same field. Um, we see that at Occupy the Farm. People are taking precaution, but coming together and working at the Guild Tract to grow food, to contribute to the food um, uh, um, boxes that are going to families who don't have access to healthy food in this moment, particularly in this moment. Um, so I do, I think there is, of course, um, many diverse ways we can have ritual and, um, and spiritful engagement. But one of those ways to me is in how we self-organize to meet our needs right now as a reflection as, of that care, that, that, you know, that public manifestation of love, I think is really important. That is what I see coming out of the peasant movements in, in the South, particularly so much in, um, in Africa right now where agroecology groups are even um, breaking government law, you know, breaking are facing incredible repression by organizing to make sure people get their food needs met or movements in India that I see where they're doing really creative actions to, um, um, the, in this time of uh, physical distancing that still express deep solidarity and care for, for their communities and the people around them. And to me, that's the kind of sort of ritual that I'm, I personally, that personally speaks to my, my heart. Thank you so much, Gopal and Dizzy. Uh, just, it just brings to mind and heart as if it's not soulful, it's not strategic and, um, just that yes. there's so much power and beauty uh, in this moment of so much complexity. Mm. And yeah, the art that, yeah, the art that's being created and shared um, mm -hmm. in, in so many different yeah. ways. And that that's kind of a, a natural transition as well. You know, that this last question really was there was a lot of questions coming from folks on this note that were, what are the yeses that we can lean into when the no is so clear right now? What are some of the yeses? Folks ask about worker co-ops, uh, how to get capital flowing the mm -hmm. right way as examples. Do y'all have any other examples to uplift? Um, I, I can, I'll start, Tessie, and then maybe you can yeah. jump in. I, I actually really want you to talk about Potion and some of your land work and, and particularly Black and Indigenous land work. Um, but. I, I first I want to say that if we think we're suddenly going to organize, like change all our organizing because of this moment to win a bunch of things, we miss we, we miss the boat. Like there's there's a lag effect in climate disruption. There's a lag effect in COVID, and there's a lag effect in organizing. So what I think personally, I think what's inspiring right now is the way. For example, the seed commons and the worker co-op movement, and um, are able to march to building on their relationships and their shared resources, collectively organize to um, support cooperatives to be more stable, to keep people um, working, to support each other. Um, uh, like that, they they are well prepared. They are more res we are more resilient in this moment because of the organizing that's been happening for decades. And I think that to me is um, really important. I do think there are things that we can win, and w both in policy and in organizing. Um, I read uh, in the in the in in the uh, media that. Seattle, which many cities are closing streets so people can walk. Seattle just made 20 miles of streets permanently closed to through traffic. Um, uh, I heard that, that some of the, the airline bailout in of Air France, then um, my housemate was telling me that the, the, the French bailout of Air France they the conditions of that was no more flights that to locations you could take to take by train that you could reach by train there are actually opportunities here unlike in the united states where we'll write blank checks to corporations opportunities to actually require uh transformations through how we navigate the the change and i i think the the kinds of What's on full display right now is that um, housing is in fact a human right. 
in a moment of crisis, people don't think it's okay to kick people out of their homes. And now we have to remind people that this economy is a crisis every day for millions and millions of people. And that's, that's, I think, in some ways, the yeses, the yeses are the same yeses we've been organizing towards. They're just not going to suddenly appear. The or- opportunity to organize towards them doesn't suddenly materialize right now. The moment makes the organizing that we've done possible to take advantage of. Mm-hmm. I think on that note, um, what comes to mind for me is supporting a rematriation movement. Um, I, uh, I think a, a big part of uh, land reparations and the Bay has been um, shifted and defined by the work of the Gorote Land Trust. And for folks on this call who haven't heard of them, I encourage you to check them out. Maybe we could put a link to their website in the chat. But um, for me, thinking about the ways that we can move more land uh, into um, Black and Indigenous projects um, to begin to think about how we might uh, practice governance in new ways and some of the work that's been set in place before this crisis, what, where is the time right now to think more radically about uh, redistributing land and wealth um, into the the movement containers and spaces that have been organizing for a while to to be able to to transform those resources and put them back into the web of life and move some of the feedback loops we talked about forward. Um, I will say that our next session on translocal organizing, we're gonna go in depth on this and have some more examples and hear from a lot of different folks moving um, regional projects to codify uh, food systems uh, during and after the crisis and folks around the country doing some really amazing work. So that question of what can we say yes to, um, I feel like we're going to continue to answer that. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, you spoke to housing, so I won't, I won't go on too long. I think we have four more minutes and I know that there's a few announcements and housekeeping things that we wanted to try to do as well. So I will stop. Perfect. Thank you so much, Desi and Gopal. Just um, amazing conversation. So much, so much information to to digest and take in. I'm so excited um, to have shared this space with y'all today. To everyone who attended, to everyone who helped make this possible, we, we're so grateful. This was the first one. So we, we have three more to come. And and thanks y'all, your patience bearing along with uh, making sure that, that this could be accessible to everyone. Uh, really, really important to us. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and transition here into some next steps and to closing. I know it's hard to say goodbye, uh, but just first and foremost, wanna bring up discussion groups. As we mentioned earlier, almost 3000 people or over 3000 people registered for this webinar and over half, half of y'all said that you were forming discussion circles to deepen your collective thinking together. Uh, some folks are doing this with their family, some folks are doing it with colleagues, uh, with their formations or organizations, and some people are doing it with the uh, mutual aid groups that they have recently started working with. So if you haven't reached out to folks uh, around you yet, now's the time reminding you to message the people that you lo- love to have strategy conversations with and set it up. A reminder uh, that you can check out a guide for doing discussion groups at move- movementgeneration.org forward slash course correction. This information will be on a slide following this announcement. Uh, Secondly, just wanna give folks a heads up to look out for the email that we'll be sending out in the next couple of days. It will include readings and resources, links to the recording and discussion questions. Uh, Also get ready for session two, as Desi mentioned, we're gonna be deep diving into deep strategies and solutions. Uh, And if finance is being used as a tool to destroy life, how can we return capital to the people and the lands it was stolen from? Just a note, if you signed up for this first session, you're automatically registered for sessions two, three, and four. So you don't have to worry about uh, registering again. And want to add as well, for those who had questions today, we know there was a lot of amazing questions. We're recording and logging those questions as well so that we can speak to them throughout the the sessions that are to come. Uh, 
we're asking y'all spread the word. Let's keep building our circles and strategizing together so that we can move in a more coordinated way. Post your pictures, your thoughts, your drawings, study group session ideas on your platforms and tag us at Movement Generation. Uh, folks can use hashtag course correction, hashtag just transition, hashtag unplugged, unplug the empire, hashtag translocal organizing, get creative with it. Uh, and lastly, we just want to send a, a shout out, a call out to any artists out there who would like to continue uh, to create art out of these sessions uh, that have been inspired by the content that we've covered today. Feel free to reach out to us at course at movementgeneration.org. Once again, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you here for session two on translocal strategies for just recovery in two weeks on Tuesday, June 2nd, three to five Pacific time, four to six Mountain Standard, five to seven Central Standard and six to eight for our East Coast fam. Please stay safe, everybody. Take care of yourselves and each other, family. Peace. Thanks, y'all.